Now, the next set of slides I decided to use because I'm now also the chair of a task group on public service continuity planning for vaccine deployment. And I'm partnering with the PDRF or the Philippine Disaster Risk Resilience Foundation, which has been ongoing and helping the Office of Civil Defense develop what we call public service continuity planning for the different LGUs, for, for other hazards, for other hazards and for other crises that may happen. So I borrowed this set of slides for them in our planning for vaccine deployment. So you can see here, they, they, because it's private sector, they call it business continuity. In the public sector, when I used to teach this in PGH, I call it COOP, Continuity of Operations Planning. Uh, uh, today, the more common term we use is public service continuity plan. And actually the Office of Civil Defense and the RRMC has been implementing several LGUs. And maybe uh, this is part of your crisis planning that is actually very important. So it, they, they talk, the PDRF talks about three simple things that one needs to do. Uh, one is to assemble the team, making sure that, so we've done that. That's why we're doing this webinar. The next is to assess risk and impact analysis. It's basically what we did with the pictures that I actually showed you. And then we have what is called RTO or return to operations, the time to return to operations. Because like, for example, PGH, now they're able to do a surgery again. Uh, several weeks after, uh, after the fire, they've been able to return to uh, normal operations. By, uh, but they're still having repairs there and being built, but they've found a way to do elective surgery and emergency surgery. So that's, that's a very short period of time for return to operation. So that's actually a good, um, good indicator of how your crisis team is managing the, 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 the sooner you, you normalize, the, the, that means your crisis team has done its job. And of course, your continuity strategy and making sure that this is sustainable and con can be continued. So during the planning process, the planning team must assign a key leader to handle the following. So this is the important part. I think leadership is part of what's important in crisis management. Mahirap magkaturoan because what happens in the debrief is nagsisisihan. So everybody will just point fingers at each other. Uh, they'll point, uh, the people don't realize that when they point their forefinger to someone else, there are three other fingers pointing back at you. So it's very important that we appoint responsible roles, very important who is the leader. So we know who is, uh, who, who is playing the role and who is supporting who and who will do what and make sure that there are backup to the backup of uh, your particular plan. So the continuity plan has to be per site. If you're a chancellor of a CU, you might want a continuity plan per building because the risk of each building might be different. One might have laboratories that will have flammable items and uh, one may have just have building with offices with lots of people or one may have classrooms that are now not being used but can be what have been repurposed, let's say for uh, isolation facilities. So if there is a fire there, you need to have newer plans. So that's the other thing that happened. No, we repurposed some of our structures and uh, what we don't realize is when, when a fire happens, we don't know how to evacuate. This is what happened in PGH. We only had a plan for non-COVID times. So we didn't know what to do and where to put the COVID patients when we had to evacuate them. Kasi hindi mo sila pwedeng paghaluin. With that. So that's where what we call a contingency plan comes in. So our contingency was to distribute some of these cases to other hospitals like Santa Ana and the other DOH hospitals that accepted them. So very important yung continuity planning, contingency planning, crisis planning. So you also need documents. You'll need the floor plans of your building. You'll need to know what are stuck in that building, in that laboratory. Uh, we need to oversee emergency operations. Uh, someone's role, uh, the, the leadership role is really trying to do this. And you, you don't want the leader to be doing most of the work during the crisis. You want the leader to be doing 90% of the work prior to the crisis or when there is a rest period or an in-between crisis. So that during crisis, you, uh, you, everyone will just act. So like, for example, for us in uh, UP, we get Mahar, the UPRI, uh, NOAA always gives us data on inclement weather conditions, on weather 
what its potential is to our uh, gathering events before when we decide whether we continue graduation ceremonies or other activities. We had the, the UPRI actually brief us on the uh, potential for inclement weather. Then we ensured the handling of the vaccines. This is for our purpose. No, we were now going into the typhoon season, the rainy season where there will be floods. So my, my task group had been looking in service continuity planning of making sure that the cold chain of the vaccines do not waste several vials of vaccines. Gintu yung bakuna. We need it to fight the pandemic and if they will just be destroyed by power outages. So as you noticed, uh, just this week, this past week, I've had two crises. One is the power outage, which is uh, the finding the, the places affected for our vaccines that are in cold storage. And the second one is Typhoon Dante. So, hindi pa tapos yung aming organization, tinamaan na kaagad kami ng dalawang crisis. So, that really shows how important crisis management and crisis planning is. So, to give you an idea, this is how we tried to organize it. We said it has to be the local government vaccine operation center, wherein you will have a leader, and the leader should have several responsibilities. So, they will determine and be in charge of the oversight and making sure that there is continuity planning. So be there is business continuity plan. So this comes from the private sector, but we will call it service, uh, public service continuity plan or service continuity plan for short, if you're in government. Then you assess the vaccine site locations. So yung ginagawa ni Mahar sa UPRI. Uh, Mahar has helped us now. He's joined our group and he's matching. We've given him a list of the vaccine sites and he's overlaid it on the NOAA map on the hazards and potential hazards of the different vaccination sites. So, so that's crisis planning for you in uh, application. Then we monitor the sites for compliance and status. Remember, we've had two incidents, one in Cotabato, wherein the vaccines were wasted because the person put it in the refrigerator, not realizing the ref was unplugged. And they put it on a Friday. Of course, the vaccines were deemed uh, unuseful uh, for by, by Monday when they needed to use it. There was another one, they put it in a banka to go to Polillo Island. The, the banka size, maybe there were waves, but uh, fortunately the vaccines were undamaged because of the seal and the, the packaging that it had. It was untampered. So those vaccines were uh, declared still okay and were used for Polillo Island. So you need to act decisively as the person. That's the problem in a crisis you probably will need to act with little information. And sometimes you will uh, realize that what you, you did is probably not the appropriate action, but you're free to change that so that you can do the appropriate action as more data and information come in. So th then you're given authority. The, the, the chief or your supervisor must give you the authority to be able to make certain changes in the way you are. And then for specific site management, or in, our, in other words, deans, for example, I can look at this like this is the system and then the chancellor, the chancellor and then his, his uh, person responsible and then his uh, site would be the colleges or a dean that would be in charge of it. They'd have to create their own site continuity plan. So it's not one plan, no? that's why you were all in this workshop. Uh, we have the general guidelines of how you can do this planning but the planning process is very specific to each one of you that come from each of the regions. So you'll also have to be monitoring. So there's work in between this planning. It's not a piece of paper that you just finish and then submit like a thesis. It's got to be a living plan. So you can keep modifying it and improving it depending on uh, whether needs arise or equipment come in or any change in the architecture or uh, you know, functionality of the, the building, you need to adapt the plan and keep it uh, living. Okay. So these are the uh, ways you can identify critical resources needed to smoothly run. Let's say, uh, as I said, an example is a vaccine program at the LGU level. So we look at threats. So the threats can be natural, or induced by technological or biological external events. So we're looking at an example of heavy rainfall causing flooding. So the critical elements of what will happen to the people. Can the people go to work if it's flooded? If the facility, if the facility gets flooded, will, will equipment be damaged? Will supplies be damaged? 
to the public. Can you open it? Yet it's flooded and people cannot go to their vaccine sites. Your IT, if your IT, how will you report your activities for the day if your internet connection is down? And vaccines, will the vaccines arrive if there is flooding? So these are critical elements. So you look at the people, you look at the public, you look at your IT and you look at your vaccines. And then what the impacts will be. The impact is how, what are the possible scenarios. Ito yung forward thinking or foresight looking. You do a forward looking, uh, two words I always ask, what if? So ganun lang ang crisis planning. You ask that question, what if? And if you're able to make all the answers to the what if questions, the many what if questions you will rise, you'll probably be good in your crisis plan. So, so staff is unable to report to work, unable to go to their appointments, etc. Your problem will know. So these are some possible threats or hazards. We call it hazards in disaster medicine. We call it threats in crisis management. So it's different terminologies, but it's meaning the same thing. And it was mentioned also that we look at the uh, typhoons, uh, heavy rainfall, flooding, heavy rainfall, uh, volcanic eruption, earthquake, and even uh, armed conflict. So that's uh, those are possible. So, so we did this a little earlier with the exercise with the pictures. So with fire, you can have burns, inhalation injury. You can have power outage with civil unrest or a cyber attack, for example. Uh, your internet can go down and you're unable to report your, your activities. And transport affected also in times that there is a man-made or civil unrest. So this is an example of a risk scoring matrix. We don't have to follow this. I'm giving this as an example of how we plan risks. So you'll know what to address because some, some risks are so unlikely, they may have catastrophic effects, but they're so unlikely, it might not be the right risks to address. So, so, so you have the impact, you rank it from one to five, one being negligible effect to the institution, five being catastrophic to the institution, talagang hindi na kayo maka-function or major, major effects to the institution. I think uh, for this pandemic, our pandemic effects on our uh, academic functions is like major. To me, it's number four, it's major. It affected face-to-face, -face. some people have delayed classes, some people cannot go on internet. And then you look at the, its likelihood. Well, uh, this was a rare event, I think. I think the, if you consider the pandemic, it had a major effect on our institution, but it was its likelihood is kind of rare. So the past pandemic that happened was 100 years ago in 1918. So clearly, it's something you wouldn't have been planning very well. But if, if let's say we were having pandemics every day, now, uh, now that we've heard, learned from this pandemic, the next pandemic is possible. So it becomes a higher category now and we, we have these points to add here. And so this is the matrix, you use the points to understand that. And then for each, for, for each threat, you can look at the risk. So you can say, you can classify, if you score it and one to three, it will be a considered a low risk. If you score it four to six, it will be moderate risk and then so on and so forth. So if I were a crisis committee of a CU, I'd of course do all, no? I'd like to have plan crisis plan for all this risk. But sinong uunahin ko? Of course, I will in, do first planning for the very high risk. For example, fire. Because fire is a potential in our laboratories, in our old electrical wiring, in old buildings. So this is a, a very high priority because the risk of fire is there. And we saw what happened to Philippine General Hospital. It's an electrical fire. Especially today, uh, we've discovered at the hospital that as we buy more medical equipment, the wiring doesn't carry the same load that it was designed for because it was built in the 80s. And that central block was designed only for few equipment. Now, as we attach robotic machines, laparoscopic machines, ultrasound machines, x-ray machines, we kept buying them. And then you operate them all together. Maybe those wires get burnt out and then their insulation gets weaker. So it's very important to have a review of the electrical load a particular building, especially a repurposed one, must have. So that's the good. Then you put it all out here. And this is what I call the RTO, the recovery time objective. 
and your idea is that uh, you must be able to return to activities, the normal activities. So if you're able to return uh, to activity sooner, it's actually a low priority. So very important to do that. So we can do that in a table. You list down all these uh, potential risks of your particular CU, and then you put a likelihood score, you put the impact score, and you put your risk score and your RTO hours that you want to achieve the response to it. So you'll have a table and checklist in the end. Uh, I prefer using my own methodology. So this is just one methodology. There are many methodologies if you study the internet. There are many methodologies to crisis management. My preference, my own work is really you using timelines. So I sit down in a table, I ask people, there's a fire on the third floor, what's going to happen? So, and then I list all the activities of what's going to happen. I put the, the time that's needed to be done to call the fire department, who will call the fire department, and then identify that. And then I put them all in a sequence of timelines and then be able to now get rules and uh, identify people because in one column, it will say who will do this. So you'll put all those that he's going to do, for example, the safety officer, everything that the safety officer does will actually be uh, listed in his uh, function list. And in, in when I was head of uh, ER at the Philippine General Hospital, I had what was called a disaster box. The disaster box had their IDs, safety officer, triage officer, and all they needed to do was look behind it and the checklist of the timelines were there of what they were doing. It said, for example, it says there, triage officer. If you, it's that card is given to you by the incident commander, you will read the first thing that says there is, do not treat patients. Your, your job is to just classify severity of illness. So then it will give you through all the steps. So we'll study that some more in the next session with the incident command system. So we list control measures that include mitigation and contingency. Not all crises you can prevent. So some of the crises, what you need to do is actually mitigate them. And sometimes not all the crises you plan for, so you end up with what is called contingency planning. So like for example, uh, this particular uh, pandemic, there was no plan for COVID-19, but there was a plan for uh, pandemic. So that's why we have the interagency task force on managing management of emerging infectious diseases. And, uh, and then what they did is we, they created the national action plan, which created the national task force of which I'm actually in as a consultant. So these are the important things. You list down the risks, you list down your control measures to mitigate it. You risk your uh, mitigation and contingency that must be available to you especially as, a, uh, as an administrator. So all of you need to go through this process. It's not the piece of paper asking someone in the agency to do this. It's got to be everybody's role so that anyone can step up the plate and understand the whole process of risk analysis. So, so ito yung mga ad additional things that we do that in that table. So, so you also plan it, no? So you subject it. Once you've done your planning, you, you've got to subject it to a simulation or an exercise. I'm not for very large uh, simulation exercises. I'm more for tabletop, just sitting in a conference table and doing a comms plan with a scenario. So I think that's the best. Maybe I think that's what's going to happen to you with our uh, system crisis committee. We will observe. You will make your own plans. We will actually just test it with the crisis that we will inject and find out how your plan bears up to that particular uh, situation. So very important to have your operational checklists so that people, anyone can just come in the role. If that person is absent or is injured, then someone else can take the role and they can just use the operational checklist to be able to do the plan. So it becomes an institutional memory. There you go. So that's exactly what happened in PGH. no? The people that was the middle of the night. So the people actually that played the role were people who were on duty that night, not the administration officials. So yung administration officials later on na lang sila dumateng nung tinawag sila. So, so very important. Ang, uh, well, this is really for the uh, for the vaccination site. So they're talking about 
in case of an emergency of a reaction, you must have available medical kit. You must have sufficient supply of and both the vaccine and the ancillary supplies. You can have all the vaccines from the national government, pero pag wala ka namang karayom or needle or bulak or alcohol, baka hindi ka rin makapag-vaccinate. So it's important that you also check the uh, ancillary supplies. So sometimes it's that simple. One piece of device, especially in an operating room, kung minsan one piece of gadget lang ang kulang to continue and proceed, the whole operation is actually canceled. So it's the same no? to, to prevent transmission or infection in the site, whether you need PPE for the staff, what PPE will they work, will be using, and, and then the ventilation of the area and other uh, activities there. And you must have emergency protocols aligned with your local DRRMO. So DRRMO is your Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office, and each LGU has one. So as a university, we need to actually be coordinating with our uh, city DRRMO, whether in what city you are, like for example, Diliman coordinates with the city DRRMO of Quezon City. Manila uh, coordinates with the city DRRMO of Manila. So these are the people that will help us for external assistance because not all the time we will be able to handle our crisis on our own. We will require help of the local government. So it's very important that... Uh, we already know them. We already talk to them. We already meet with them. So my my uh, advice to all the chancellors here is to engage, engage your uh, local government's uh, DRRM officers and office. So sit in their meetings if you're invited. Make sure that your the crisis manager you appoint will be very active and known by all these people. So this is an example of how we have service continuity planning for the vaccination site in, let's say, Marikina. Uh, the, they used the Marikina Sports Complex, which was right across the Amang Rodriguez Memorial Medical Center. So very important yung location and GIS mapping to find out egress, ingress and egress of uh, additional supplies, assistance, so that you can, you, you can make sure. The first thing that happens is I remember seeing the... Uh, the bombing in Jakarta, and they showed me a slide of what happened. There were several ambulances that responded to the bombing in the Marriott Hotel. But what happened was there was a traffic jam at the entrance of the uh, hospital, of the uh, Jakarta General Hospital. And uh, all the ambulances were coming from different directions. And it was mayhem so that there was delay in the management of uh, the cases because they were bleeding and they had... Uh, injuries from the bomb blast. So these are the sample things we knew. So we will assemble the team. I think if you're here, you have been identified to be part of this uh, crisis team and you will need to be coordinating. So, so that's the team for the response. So these are just the examples of how uh, visualization will help us. We have the UPRI to help us with all of this for all of you in the different CUs. The UPRI have several uh, mappers and uh, uh, hazard maps that can be used and they are probabilistic. So they can even uh, detect the height of water through flood waters. They can detect the path of the typhoon that's happening. So use that resource because we're spending for UPRI. And then your uh, impact assessment and uh, uh, risk report. So it's very important to make that kind of uh, report so that you will be able to give it to your superiors who will add either the needs that you have and the requirements for development. And of course, your continuity planning, uh, how much of the staff will be absent because of the incident, et cetera. <clears throat> 